Well, good evening. Good to see everybody. And it's a great privilege to be here. You know, the Apostle Paul wrote in Galatians, the sixth chapter. And if you folks have your Bible, why don't you turn with me real quick to Galatians. And uh, in the sixth chapter, we find in verse number seven, Be not deceived. God is not mocked. For whatsoever man soweth, that shall he also reap. For he that soweth to the flesh shall of the flesh reap corruption. But he that soweth to the Spirit, it shall of the Spirit reap life everlasting. And let us not be weary in well-doing, for in due season we shall reap if we faint not. You know, there's this concept of sowing and reaping is not only in the letters of Paul, but is also in the teachings of Jesus. It was also in the Old Testament. Basically, what we're looking at is three concepts in sowing and reaping scenarios. First of all, number one, you will sow what you reap. Okay? Be it good or be it bad. Whatever seed you put in the ground, it's going to come up. Okay, number two. You will reap in a different season than what you sow. You can't sow today and expect to get fruit tomorrow. It don't work that way. And principle number three. You always reap far more than what you sow. Sometimes that's good, and sometimes that's not so good. Now, Jesus gave one example of what he felt was a good example of sowing and reaping in a parable that really wasn't necessarily a parable, but is in a teaching that we are very familiar. Uh, all of you probably grew up knowing it as the Good Samaritan. Now, the amazing thing about Jesus is that a good many of his teachings came from, um, from actual events, real lifetime events. And Jesus took that natural event and that historical event and molded it into a teaching that he wanted to present to his disciples or to the people that he was, uh, that he was talking to. So why don't you turn, if you have your Bibles, to the book of uh, Luke, the 10th chapter of Luke. And we will begin to read at uh, verse number 25. Now, we're not going to read this whole thing, but we will, we will read enough of it to bring in the, the major parts of the Good Samaritan. And behold, a certain lawyer stood up and tempted him, saying, Master, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? Let me pause for a minute and explain this to you. This was at a gathering that Jesus was at, and there were some Pharisees there and some scribes, and then these lawyers. Now, the lawyers uh, typically um, in, the, uh, in the Jewish state, they were... Uh, scribes educated in a Jewish uh, uh, educational facility. But ever since the time of Herod the Great, Herod ruled the Jews, but he despised the Jews. And in courts of law, uh, which included uh, personnel that uh, were judges as well as attorneys, and uh, Herod did not allow those personnel to be Jews. They were non-Jews working on behalf of Herod on, for a Jewish crime or someone that was a, responsible for a crime who was a Jew. Now, later on, after Herod died and uh, his sons died, then it went back to how it had been, uh, which were Jewish lawyers and Jewish judges and so forth. But under the reign of Herod the Great, and the reign of Herod uh, Antipas and Herod Archilochus, then it was not the case. Herod appointed these men. 
and most of them were unbelievers. But when they got together, the Pharisees and the scribes who were Jewish, <clears throat> they were very proud of themselves because to them, as they had been taught and as they continued to teach at that time, because of their position, because they were a Pharisee, because they were a scribe, then they automatically inherited heaven or their eternal rewards. There, uh, there was no sin that would keep them out because no sin would dare stand against a Pharisee or no sin, no sin would, would, would dare to threaten the eternal life of a scribe or a Pharisee. So they automatically inherited eternal life so as they thought. Now we know it's not true, but they did teach that. Uh, but here at this setting, then there was a attorney that was there, a lawyer. This lawyer was appointed by Herod, and this is what he asked. He said, Behold, a certain lawyer stood up and tempted him, or Jesus, saying, Master, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? In other words, we know what the Pharisees say about themselves. We know what the scribes say about themselves. What about me? I'm not born with eternal life. How, how do I get eternal life? And then Jesus answered and said, he said unto the men, what is written in the law? How readest thou? And he answered and said, or the lawyer answered and said, thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, with all thy soul, with all thy strength, and all thy mind, and thy neighbor as thyself. He said unto them, Jesus said unto uh, the lawyer, Thou hast answered right, this do, and you shall live. But he, meaning the lawyer, willing to justify himself, said to Jesus, And who is my neighbor? Then Jesus answering and said, A certain man went down from Jerusalem to Jericho and fell among thieves, which stripped him of his raiment and wounded him, departed, leaving him half dead. And by chance there came down a certain priest. Now this is a Jewish priest, priest that way. And when he saw him, he passed by on the other side. And likewise a Levite, when he was at the place, came and looked on him and passed by on the other side. But a certain Samaritan, as he journeyed, came where he was or where the wounded man was. And when he saw him, he had compassion on him and went to him and bound up his wounds, pouring in oil and wine and set him on his own beast or on his animal, a donkey, camel or whatever, and brought him to an inn and took care of him. And on the morrow, when he departed, he took out two pence and gave them to the host and said unto him, take care of him. And whatsoever thou spendest more, when I come again, I will repay thee. Which now of these three thinkest thou was neighbor unto him that fell among the thieves? And he, me and the lawyer, said, He that showed mercy on him. Then said Jesus unto him, Go and do thou likewise. Now, this has been betrayed for many years as a parable, which means a teaching that Jesus used uh, to give a, a moral teaching. And in the, our particular case, it was a uh, sowing and reaping type of teaching. But many of Jesus' parables, as we said initially, uh, was not a story made up by Jesus. They were based on actual true and historical events. And this is an event that has its foundation in truth. The governor, the Roman governor of Judah at the time was Valerius Gratius. And Valerius Gratius uh, was the governor of, of Judea and uh, the headquarters for the Roman government in the in in the uh, in that region was 
Caesarea Maritima. And in the year A.D. 15, then Valerius Gratius appointed his nephew. His nephew's name was Marcus Antonius Spartacus. He appointed him to be the Minister of Taxation. Now, the Minister of Taxation was responsible for all of the Roman taxes that was collected in all of Judea. He was responsible for gathering it and for having it uh, in safekeeping until it was able to be transferred to Rome at uh, twice a year. But the gathering of the taxes would take place and then it would be uh, then collected and delivered to Caesarea Maritima, the governor that was there. Now, the, although the governmental offices were in Caesarea Maritima, which was on the coast, the Mediterranean coast, uh, the Ministry of Taxation was not. It was located in Jerusalem. And primarily because they used that opportunity for a central location of Jerusalem because people would come to Jerusalem for Passover, for a Feast of Tabernacles, Feast of Trumpets, and on and on and on. And so in each one of these feast days in which Jews would swarm into Jerusalem, they took the opportunity there to tax the people who came there and to gather those taxes. Now, the, uh, the taxes were, were gathered, and then every 40 days, the uh, taxes were, uh, were brought into the treasury in Jerusalem. And then every third 40 day, so in other words, every 120 days, then there was a, a, an announcement that went out. And this announcement went out from the governor saying that on this particular day, that all of the tax receipts would be transferred from Jerusalem to Caesarea Maritima, the governor's office. Now that didn't seem to be very smart because if you give the announcement of the day that it's going to happen, you invite every robber in the, in the country to be ready for it. But the governor was waiting on that. And so what he did is that he spelled out the route that would be taken from Jerusalem to Caesarea Maritima. And on the day that the money was being transferred, then he uh, declared that no one was allowed to be on that road except the caravan of money and 50 Roman soldiers to protect it. So there was a cart or a wagon with the money in it and the soldiers were there to uh, protect front and back. And no one was allowed to be on the road. Even if you lived on the road, you had to evacuate your house. No one was allowed to be one mile either side of the road. And if you were caught one mile either side of that road, you spent five years in prison. It didn't matter whether you weren't planning on robbing it or not. Just the fact that you were there is enough to put you in prison. And then if you were caught trying to uh, steal the money, then you're in extreme, extreme penalty because it meant death. Without argument, without defense, death automatic. And so everything went well for a while. Every 120 days, there was no problems. There was the, the money was brought to the Roman office and everything was fine. But then on one of those occasions, some rebels from the Galilee, they call them zealots, they came up with the idea that we would rather sacrifice some of our guys and get the money rather than not have it at all. 
And so they worked out a system of robberies and a successful system of robberies. And for five times in a row, the tax receipts were stolen successfully by these zealots in the Galilee. By the time the fifth one took place, Emperor Tiberius was absolutely livid. He went ballistic. And for the first and only time in the history of the Roman Empire, a Roman emperor came to Judea. And he came into Caesarea Maritima for one reason only, and that's to nail Governor Gratius and the Minister of Taxation, Spartacus. He said, this will not happen again, period. This will not, will not happen again. Spartacus asked to be heard. The emperor gave his permission. And Spartacus says, you know, uh, emperor, I have, a, I have a proposal that I think would work if we would, uh, if we would put it into operation. And the emperor allowed him to speak. And he said, we will put out the announcement as we normally do. And we will announce the day that the tax money will be ours being transferred. But rather than having the money in the wagon, we'll have 50 additional crack Roman soldiers, plus the other 50 that we normally would have. And then we would allow it to leave Jerusalem as always and with a scheduled uh, arrival as always. But after they leave the city, then I will take the receipts and I will place them in, uh, in, uh, in packages and in barrels and various other uh, things of, uh, that make it look like a, a merchant's packaging. And we'll put them on camels and, and, and donkeys and, and mules. And, and then I will take this caravan of animals with these packages that is not olive oil, is not grain, is not hay, is actually the tax money. And when the sun goes down, I will take this caravan in secret, the back way out of Jerusalem, the back way through the road of Jericho, through Jericho, and go the back way to Caesarea Maritima. And so this will accomplish two things. Number one, our military will be ready for the assault by the robbers and by the zealots. And we will take them and we will eliminate them at that point. Number two, this will protect the tax money. And this will guarantee that the money will arrive in the governor's office at the time that it's supposed to arrive and it will arrive safely. Tiberius Caesar liked the plan. And so he told the minister of taxation, Spartacus, he says, we approve of this plan. We will put it into operation. After the approval, then Tiberius Caesar left the coast of Caesarea Maritima, went back to Rome, and never again did a Roman emperor set foot in Judea. 
But now these two guys had the work cut out for them. The Minister of Taxation and Governor Gratis had to sell this idea. And they had to sell it not only to the zealots and the robbers, they had to sell it to the common person, to the person on the street, to let them know that everything was in hand, everything is okay, and everything will proceed as normal. And so, with the plan set, then it began. On that particular day, you know, the word went out, the announcement went out, and as always, just right after sunup, the caravan left the palace of the Ministry of Taxation and made its way to Caesarea Maritima. Again, no one was allowed to be on the road. No one was allowed a mile either side of the road. And it continued. Well, as anticipated, by the time the caravan reached the very uh, small city of Afrieta, which was about approximately eight miles uh, to the west of Jerusalem, sure enough, the caravan was attacked. There were over 70 zealots attacked the, uh, the caravan in full force, but the Romans were ready. Not only the 50 that normally accompanied, but the 50 crack uh, green berets, so to speak, that were in the uh, that were in the wagon, they were waiting for this opportunity. When all the dust cleared, 67 out of the 70 zealots were dead. The Romans lost two. And it was one of the most lopsided victories of Roman, of the entire Judean Roman occupation. And it sent a message. It sent a message far and wide that eventually Rome is going to win. And eventually Rome is going to have its way and Rome is going to be the one who is the final victor of anything and everything that is thrown against it. And it will be the uh, ultimate victor regardless of the situation. Father, we just thank you for all your many blessings. We thank you for the opportunity that you've given us here to teach. We also thank you for the lesson that you give on what we sow, that will we also reap. And we thank you that in such vivid explanations you give us in your word what is truly the way that we must live and we must approach our own life in the name of Jesus. Welcome to Canaan, a small indigenous community here on the west coast of Colombia. In recent years, Canaan has grown tremendously. The people here have a heart for God and for sharing His love. This is where the Cubit Foundation does their work. Over the years, Cubit has worked on developing the community in many ways, and by doing so, they've developed personal relationships and bonds that will last a lifetime. Viene un poco al 
cualquier persona eh, del extranjero, pues lo recibimos con mucho amor, recibimos con mucho aprecio, con mucho afecto, porque sabiendo que si esta persona ta, vive tan lejos, no nos conoce y nos viene a visitar, eso para nosotros es muy satisfactorio y, y, y toca mi corazón de una manera especial. Brad Charles is one of the leaders behind Cubit and their work in Canaan, Colombia. His passion is for helping people in need around the world and doing God's work out here on the mission field. The Cubit Foundation has done some incredible work here thus far, and God's presence is truly evident. with local Colombian churches, Cubit has taken part in service to the village of Canaan. And with your help, Cubit will continue to serve them and many more around the world. When people give to Cubit, I want them to go. I want them to go with me. And I want them to experience this. Lo imposible para el hombre es posible para Dios. To find out more and to become a part of what Cubit is doing here in Colombia, log on to cubitfoundation.org. That's cubitfoundation.org.